holy is the Lord. All right, see, be seated if you can. Boy, God is just uh, speaking to our hearts. You know, I don't know if, if you're aware of this. I think I mentioned this last week. One of the mo most difficult things, uh, maybe this be a little bit too much inside baseball, but one of the more difficult things that pastors do is when we, we feel like the Lord's given us a direction and we preach a series of messages or passages of Scripture or words that come from a, uh, from a passage. And then when you finish that, uh, what's, what next, you know? It's like, all right, Lord, uh, all of the passion and all of the uh, inspiration that you gave for what came before, um, how do we leave that and go to something else? Well, it, it's very difficult. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a sense of responsibility for sure. And I, I sense that the Lord uh, back, this was weeks ago, I started praying about it. I said, Lord, you know, we, we'll be coming on and it'll be around November sometime. And, you know, we'll be going into Thanksgiving, Christmas and all these kind of things. And so what would you, what, 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 what do you want to say <laughs> to your people? You know, and, and so I, I started um, reading in the book of Genesis and I got to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 20, and, and the Lord, I began to read about the Lord talking to Adam that it wasn't good for him to be alone and that he was going to make a help meet for him. And then God, God took, his, took his side open, took the rib out, created Eve, brought Eve to Adam, and as soon as Adam received Eve, God... Through, through Adam, it, it appears in the scripture that Adam is actually the one that's mouthing the words. But you know it's God speaking through him. And Adam makes a statement, and it, it's contained in a couple of verses, two verses, that, that display um, four, uh, I call them laws to start with, and, and you can call them laws, and I'll probably call them laws half the time, are keys if you want to call them keys, four keys, or four disciplines is what we're really dealing with. There, that there are four disciplines that Adam speaks as soon as God gives Eve to him and he receives her. He speaks four things immediately after that that, 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 are, that are laws of love, that are, that are keys to having a great love, great relationships, marriage fulfillment, and all of those kind of things. And so uh, that's what I want us to do over the next few weeks. I want us to look at these four keys, these four laws, these, these four disciplines that God gives us because uh, they're primary to our life. Every single one of us have somebody in our life that we love. And so I have somebody that love, we, we hopefully have somebody that loves us. Uh, if you're married now, you may have been married 50 years, 60 years. Tanya and I have been married 43 years. Um, long time, but, but you, never, you never get so mature and you never get so far along that the Lord can't speak something that'll bless your life and, and affect you and change you. And then some of you that are looking for mates, I know many times, you know, you're looking for a mate and, and you, you, you haven't found one and you're saying, what, all right, I've had some failures before. What would I do now that would be any different? How could I expect anything to be any different if I keep doing the same thing? What do I need to do? How, how, I mean, how is it that some people make it like 43 years, 55 years, 60 years, and, and, and others, you know, they can't make it a, a year or two? How, what, what, what happens here? Is it just some people are good and some people are not good? I mean, you know, is it luck? Is it uh, uh, soulmates, you know, like magic somehow? Oh, I find my magic one, and then I'm going to be fine, and if I don't, I'll have to keep on looking. I mean, no, 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 no. It, it, it is, it, there are four laws about love. And if you obey these laws, you'll be great. If you don't obey them, you'll be a failure. Now, it doesn't mean you won't be stubborn enough to stay together. Because there are some people that are just stubborn enough, then they're committed enough, and they say, I, bless God, we're not going to ever part, and, and you don't ever part, but you're not happy. You're not blessed. I mean, you, the relationship is not doing what God intends a relationship to do. So how do, you, how do you turn it around? I mean, can you turn it around? If you're already 25 years in, or 10 years, or 40 years, or whatever it might be, can you, can you turn it around? Well, sure you can. 
Sure you can. God, God designed marriage to be a very simple thing. Not complicated, complex, and all full of, you know, 16-cylinder things that you have to study the rest of your life. No, no. God intended for marriage to be a simple, a simple relationship. Let me, let me make two statements before, as we get started here. First of all, here's the first statement. Marriage is the safest relationship on earth when God's four keys, God's four laws of love are honored. Marriage was not created, and I put this in your notes for you, by a lawyer. Thank, thank the Lord. It wasn't created by an educator or a lonely Neanderthal somewhere. Marriage was created by Almighty God. God created marriage and established marriage, and God is a good God. And God would not create something for us that is intended to harm us in any way. This is a good thing, and God intended for marriage to be a blessing in our life. And so he gives this to us, and it becomes, when it is done God's way, it is the safest relationship on earth. And the reason I'm saying this is because there seems to be today just this, this tremendous fear of marriage in our country. Did you know that in 1930, 83% of all American adults were married? 83%. Today, somewhere between 45 and 48% of Americans are married. So what's true today about our country? That most adults are not married. That marriage somehow has received a bad name. People make jokes about marriage. You know, people downgrade marriage. Marriage gets slammed all the time. As a matter of fact, even among Christians. Marriage is looked at as this tremendously uh, foreign thing that somehow you need to be afraid of. Well, I understand why. You know why you're afraid? Because you don't know how to love somebody. That's how. We're always afraid of something that we don't know about. And so if you don't know how to love each you know why most marriages fail? People don't know how to love each other. It's just as simple as that. I'm seriously, uh, seriously, you can love somebody and you can choose who you, you know, people, are, they're always talking about uh, finding someone they love as if somehow love is all about uh, some magic enchantment, some uh, lucky uh, uh, meeting, uh, some uh, look across a room and, 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 and tingles run up and down your spine. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's talked about as if somehow it, it's, this, it's this feeling, it's this, it's this magic formula, it's this chemistry, it's this, it's this something like that. Now, listen, I want you to know that I'm not an expert about marriage. I mean, I, I didn't major in marriageology or anything like that. But I've been married for 43 years. That ought to count for something. And secondly, I've been preaching the word for 44 years, 46, I can't ever remember, since I was 18 years old. I'm 64, so figure it, you do the math. So, and I've studied it, I've preached bunches of series on love and relationship and marriage and all of that kind of stuff. And, and so I'm not an expert, but, but I have come to understand and to see that, that there are four keys in love relationships that do three things. Now this first one might shock you, they actually create love. These four laws actually create love. They promote love, they protect love. And without these laws, uh, marriage is just not gonna exist. It, it's every parent's dream for their, for, their, for their children to grow up, to leave home. Well, that's the big one, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. To grow up and to leave home. And, 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 and then what? And, and then what? And fall in love. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's at the end. And get married and have some grandchildren for you, right? And don't move back in. <laughs> but parents, you need to understand. Now listen to this. You need to understand this. No matter how old your children are, they look up to you. And you are the biggest influencer in their life. You influence them more than anybody else. 
And so your attitude about marriage, whether you're excited about it or whether you're not excited about it, has everything to do with how your children look at marriage. Even, even if they've been married for years, they still are influenced by you and, your, and, your, and, and how you act and what you say and what they feel about you. So listen, this is not one of the laws, but let's just say this would be maybe my first suggestion <laughs> to you, is no matter how much you have failed at, at marriage, I, I don't care if you've been married five times, six times, or you've been married for a long time, but it's just been kind of, uh, you've been what you would describe as growing apart, which can't happen. But, but that's what we describe, growing apart. If you're growing, you're not growing apart. But anyway, let's get off that. No matter what's been your attitude, no matter what's been your disposition about this, for the sake of those that love you the most and are watching you the most, and are affected by you the most, and will be for the rest of their life. If you don't have a good, um, if you don't have a good heart for, for, for marriage, let me just ask you to ask the Lord to change you. Just, just go to him and simply say, you know, Father, I, I, I know that marriage is a gift from you. So how could it be bad? So what I'm experiencing, maybe it hadn't been good. Maybe I'm, I'm crusty about it. I'm bitter about it. I'm, I'm a little hostile toward it. I, I just, I'm not even sure that it could happen, but Lord, I, I'm gonna believe that you, you created it, you gave it to us, and it's for our good, and Lord, change my heart and change my attitude because no matter whether you're speaking negatively about marriage or you're sitting there silently while somebody else is speaking negatively about marriage and telling marriage jokes and you're laughing at them and all that, let me just tell you, your children are watching you. And they're seeing what you think about it and how you handle it, and it really does matter what happens. If half of the people in America, and I, I'm not sure about the statistics worldwide, but if half of the people in America are not marrying now, uh, there has to be a reason for that. I mean, if you, if you, had, if you went to the airport and, and watched the airplanes take off and half of the airplanes that left the airport were crashing, it would be a sign of, of intelligence if you ask the question, why would anybody want to get on one of them? If half of them are going to crash, what intelligent human being would want to get on one of those planes? I mean, that would be a reasonable question. That'd be the kind of question that I would like to ask about it. I mean, if, if half of the people in our country aren't married, and many more uh, marry and divorce and marry and divorce and marry. And I mean, every time, you know the statistics about this, every time you get married and then you get a divorce, it's easier next time to get a divorce. I'll, and I'm gonna tell you why in this series, not today, but in the series, you, you'll see why. So what we need to do, I think, is just take a little step here and see if we can demystify this thing. It's not, it's not a mysterious deal. It's not, it's not something that's difficult to understand. And it'll make all the difference in the world in how you look at your relationship with God, marriage, life, all of the things. It'll bless your life. All right, so I told you that I was reading Genesis chapter two. Let's put it up here, Tan, verse 20. All right, here's the passage. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took out one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. Now notice just right off the bat that God did not create Eve from the dust of the ground like he created Adam. So from the very beginning, this means, and God's showing us that women are more complicated and more expensive than we are, guys. All right. And he brought her to man. 
And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In other words, she has bones like my bones. She has flesh like my flesh. She doesn't have ostrich skin. She doesn't have elephant hide. Her bones look like my bones. She doesn't look like a rhinoceros, thank God. I mean, it doesn't sound very romantic what he said, but it really, you know, he's making a really great statement here. But, uh, you know, momentous times call for momentous statements, right? One small step for man, one giant leap for man. I mean, you know, momentous occasions call for momentous statements. But you would think Adam blew it, but he's really saying, okay, God, thank you that she doesn't look like an orangutan or something or another. Thank you that she looks like me and she has skin. I, li I like her skin better than my skin, but she has skin like me. She shall be called man with a womb. That's what woman means, man with a womb. So no matter how many sex changes you get, you're not a woman. You can't have a womb. So if you're not a womb man, you're not a woman. Besides your DNA is all male. But because she was taken out of man. Now here comes the statement now. Here are, here's the statement that contains all four of these laws. Therefore, at, now this is Adam. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So God creates Eve, he promises Adam, then he creates her, and then he brings her to Adam, and he gives her to Adam, and Adam receives her with this wonderful statement, thank you God, that she's like me and she looks like she's perfect. And then God speaks in two verses these four uh, disciplines that we need to know about love, right? I mean, immediately from the start, God says, all right, this is what you need to know. And he said it. Now remember, Adam and Eve did not have a father. Now technically, you could say, okay, God is their father because he created them but not in the strict biological sense like we create children nowadays. They, they had no father. But even if you want to argue, okay, God's their father. Okay, well, let's say that. They had no mother. They weren't born. It, you, when we get to heaven, you're going to know who Adam and Eve are. You know how? They're going to be the only ones in heaven that don't have a belly button. Isn't that profound? You came all the way to church today to hear that, didn't you? When we get to heaven... All the rest of us gonna have a belly button because we had a mama. Adam and Eve don't have a belly button because they don't have a mama. They weren't attached to some umbilical cord. All right, so anyway, besides all that, my, 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 my point is God obviously was not speaking to Adam and Eve because when he said a man shall leave his father and mother, they didn't have a mother and father to leave. So obviously, God was not saying that for the benefit of Adam and Eve. He was saying that for the, for, the, for the benefit of the generations of humanity that would follow Adam and Eve. So just like God created the universe in Genesis chapter 1, and he created all of the laws that govern the universe, the gravity, the propulsion, the you know, uh, force, uh, uh, every law that governs the universe, when God created the universe, he created the law that governed the universe. And here in Genesis chapter two, right after the creation of Eve, and when the first couple was brought together immediately, God said, all right now, let me tell you the laws that are gonna, that are gonna cover love relationships. Just like the laws of the universe, this is gonna cover love relationship. And these laws, now listen, they work for everyone. There are not special people that these laws work for and others they fail at. It's not the smart ones, it's not the spiritual ones, it's not the pretty ones. It's, I mean, they work for everybody and if you violate them, uh, it's gonna hurt you and if you honor them, it's gonna bless you in life. And there's no mystery, no magic, no luck, no any of that kind of stuff. So, first of all, I mentioned that God didn't create Eve from dust. He created her from the rib of Adam. He, he put Adam to sleep, cut Adam's side open, took out a rib, closed it back up, took the rib and created Eve. Why did he do that? Well, if you listened to the little podcast last week, you, you already know why. But the reason why is very simple, because God was creating a covenant. 
Marriage is a covenant. Now, you might not be too excited about a covenant, but let me tell you what a covenant is. A covenant, the word covenant is the word, Hebrew word barif, which means to cut. So in order for a covenant to happen, there has to be the shedding of blood. I know many of you have watched uh, old westerns and movies like that, and you've seen the Indians and the cowboy, and you've seen them have all kinds of bouts and all kinds of things like that. And you've seen them come to a point where they say, look, we need to quit all this fighting, we need to quit all this killing, and we need to become blood brothers. And one of them will take a knife and he'll cut his hand, and the other one will take a knife and cut his hand, and then they'll put their hands together and their blood will intermingle, and they, and, and they will be blood brothers. That's what a covenant is. It means you are, a, you, are a, you are now a brother of mine. We are in covenant with each other. Now, you and I have a covenant with Jesus in salvation because Jesus shed his blood for us. And the blood that he shed for us created a covenant that we have with God. Uh, Tanya, put Mark 14 right here. Look at verse 20. This is the covenant. This, this is the covenant that we have through Christ with God. Then he took the cup. This was, you know, at the Last Supper, and he had taken the bread, and he broke it, and he blessed it, and he gave it to him. said, this is my body broken for you. This is the next verse. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. So Jesus said, I shed my blood, you are now in a covenant with God. So when you are in a covenant with someone, what does that mean? Well, it means that you, have, you are now in a permanent sacrificial relationship. Are you hearing? I, I know that doesn't sound very exciting. But when you are in a covenant, and remember marriage is a covenant now, God took Eve out of Adam's side, blood, the covenant, man, woman, marriage, covenant. When you are in a marriage, you are in a covenant. That's what you should be in anyway. It, that means you are in a permanent sacrificial relationship. It says, look, it says, I'm all in. I, hey, uh, no matter what happens, no matter how bad it is, no matter how catastrophic things might get, look, I am in this all the way to the top and I'm not gonna back out and I'm not gonna leave you and I'm not gonna forsake you, I'm all in. What, what do normal, normal marriage vows say? I mean, people nowadays have all these designer vows, but, but what, do, uh, what do normal marriage vows? I've done hundreds of weddings. You know, uh, do you, uh, sir, uh, promise uh, this beautiful young lady that you will love her, honor her, cherish her, uh, uh, forsaking all others, cleave only to her so long as you both shall live? I do. Say the same thing, sir. And then I say this. Then are you given to each other for better or worse, for sickness as well as in health, until death shall part you. That's covenant. Mm -hmm. What covenant means is when things are richer, nobody has to tell you to hang on and stay put. When things are richer, you're excited. Covenant, you don't have to have a covenant when everything's richer. Man, everybody gonna stay when it's richer. What is the covenant part of this deal? Poorer. That stinks, right? When this thing goes south and we don't have any money and we can't make any money and we're struggling for the next meal, I'm not gonna leave you. That's what you're saying. That is a covenant promise. When you say for better or worse, nobody has to have a promise to stay when it's better. It's the worst part that's the covenant part of this deal. It's when things aren't better, when they are actually worse and may, maybe even like may more, way, may more uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Way more worser or, or way worse. <laughs> that's the covenant part, right? In sickness as well as in health. When you're healthy and everything's great, nobody has to have a covenant for that. But when, when you get sick, and when everything starts going and you got to take care of them and you sacrifice your life, look, look, what you are doing when you 
proclaim those vows as you are establishing a covenant, which means a permanent sacrificial relationship until death takes both of you or one of you away from here. So what if you don't want a covenant marriage? Well, you can have a contract marriage. Now, sadly, in America, that's what most people have nowadays. A contract marriage says, well, first of all, what is a contract for? I mean, you, got, you business people, you know what a contract's for, right? A contract basically protects my rights and limits my responsibilities. When I form a contract with you, I create a contract that's gonna protect my rights. It's going to say, I have the right to this, I have the right to that. It's going to protect my rights. And it's going to limit my responsibilities. It means I don't have to do that and I'm not going to have to do that. That is a contract. So a covenant sacrifices, <laughs> sacrifices my, my rights and expands my responsibilities. A contract marriage limits my rights and limits, or expands my rights and limits my responsibilities, just the opposite. In other words, a contract marriage is totally selfish. It's basically saying, look, uh, I'm gonna stay with you as long as everything's okay, as long as you treat me right, and as long as everything goes all right, I'm gonna stay with you, and then if it goes bad, then you know I, I, I'm, I'm out of here. So I just wanna say this before we get started and as we get started with all of this. In marriage, you get what you pay for. He said, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, all right, let me, let me explain. In love, in relationships, you're gonna get what you pay for. So if you wanna begin a relationship, now listen, if you wanna begin a, a, a relationship with someone by moving your clothes into their closet without a covenant, don't even have a contract, much less a covenant, that's your business. But I'm telling you, you're gonna pay for that because that thing's gonna end as quickly as it began. Yeah. But if you wanna start up your relationship with a covenant where you accept your responsibility, they accept their responsibility, you're all in, you say, I'm all in for better, worse, sickness, health, this is a covenant, and we're gonna, and we're gonna, we're gonna have this for the rest of our life, you're gonna get what you pay for, you're gonna have love that lasts a lifetime, you're gonna have a different type of love, it's gonna be a different type of relationship. So, let's talk about laws for just a second, because uh, I'm gonna get to the, to the first law today, at the end, quickly, so don't be nervous. Uh, I, I just wanna talk to you about, kind of set up what, what happens with laws. I mean, why do we have laws? I told you that God has four laws of marriage and the universe has laws and all that. What, what, what do laws actually do? Well, law does, laws do three things. Well, first of all, they create order. Without laws, you can't have order, right? The laws of the universe, the law of gravity. The law of gravity is one of God's universal laws. What if we didn't have gravity? Well, we, we, wouldn't have, we, wouldn't, we couldn't have order. Things would just be on and off. Second thing it does is it creates safety. Order, safety. As long as you obey the laws, you're safe, right? And predictability. Predictability just says it's gonna happen the same way every time. Now, let's just suppose, as an example, there was no law of gravity. Let's just say gravity is not a law. Let's just say gravity is a suggestion, all right? That sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not true. And you're sitting on a runway at, in an airplane. And you hear the pilot come on and the pilot says, uh, <clears throat> well, folks, we have had some surprisingly good gravity this week. And I think we can go ahead and, uh, and take off. But let's just hope that it stays for a little while because last week we did lose a couple of planes uh, to outer space uh, when gravity quit right in the middle of our takeoff. So uh, just uh, relax, relax, and, uh, and, and I hope you have a, a good flight. Now, aren't you glad that gravity is a law? Laws create order, safety, and predictability. And God created marriage with some laws. 
God created the entire universe and after every creation, you know what God said? And it was good. Until he creates man and in Genesis chapter two, he sees man walking all alone and then what did God say? God said, this is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. I did not create man to be alone. I can't bless man when he's alone. Now don't, if you're single, don't take that personally. I'm just saying that what God intended was for us to have a mate and that it to be a blessing in our life. And God said that when we're not together, that it is not good to be alone and that he was going to, he was going to create that. And so as soon as he created Eve, God blessed them as a couple. You remember what he said? He said, all right, he, uh, he blessed them and he said, what? Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, take hold of the earth, take command of the earth, the earth is yours, and so forth, so forth. So that was God's intention. And so God created us for marriage is basically what I'm trying to say to you. And there are a few people that aren't married and a few people never be married. And I know some people say, man, I'm not even interested in being married. I never have been interested in being married. Well, you know why? Because God has given you a gift. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 tells you what kind of gift it is. I call it the gift of celibacy is what I call it. You, but, but, but it is a gift from God. You're not a freak. You're not a subculture. It, it's, a, it's a blessing from God and God gives it to you. And that means that you don't, you know, you don't have to have a mate. You're not, uh, you know, the, you have things that others of us don't have. You have the ability to be uh, completely satisfied without a mate or anything to do with uh, relationships and all that kind of stuff. And that is, by the way, a gift from God if you have that kind of thing. But just let me tell you this, there are not many that have it. I know we have a whole religious denomination that tried to make all of their leaders that way, but as you can tell from the last 100, 200 years and all the things that have been discovered, uh, it doesn't work that way. You can't make somebody this way. They are this way, given a gift by God or not. All right, so let's look at the first law. The law of priority, just real quick. All right, the law of priority, that's the first law. And it comes in verse 24, it's the first statement. Look at it. Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother. This is the first law, the law of priority. This is saying that marriage has to come first. That nothing can be a higher priority in my life than my marriage. It has to come before the children. Are you listening to me? It has to come before the children. It has to come before work. It has to come before church. Now notice I did not say the Lord. I said church. It has to come before recreation video games, social media, friends, etc. And if marriage is not first place, then it's not going to work. Because the Lord said it's got to be number one or, 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 or it's not going to work. Look at verse, in verse 24, the word leave. A man shall leave, it says, his mother and father. It's the, it's the word azav, which means to let go. So what, what God is saying here now, to, this is the first couple now, remember? And they don't have a mother or father. And so he's saying it not for them, but for us. So, because we do have a mother and father. And he's saying, the first thing you've got to know is when you come together and you create a covenant with each other, you are in covenant with each other. And the first thing you have to do is let go. Let go of the relationship that you have with your mother and father. Now, the reason he used mother and father, he could have said a lot of other different people there, but mother and father is the closest blood bond that we have. And he says, so just to illustrate how, what a priority your marriage has to be and that nothing can come before it, I'm going to use the, the strongest blood bond that you have in your life and that you've had for all of your life. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, the first thing that you have to do is let go of them. You've heard the old statement, blood is thicker than water. What does that mean? 
That means if there's a fight, stick with the family, right? But let me give you a covenant saying that's stronger than that. Blood may be thicker than water, but the spirit is thicker than blood. When you, when you are married, when you enter a covenant relationship, that becomes the highest relationship that you have in your life. Just to illustrate that, let me show you what Jesus had to say about this in Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, the Jews have come to Jesus and the Jews have said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? In other words, I mean, are there any boundaries on the fact that a man could, could divorce his wife? And here's what Jesus said in Matthew 19. And he answered and he said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined or cleave to his wife and they too shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. This is the principle that Jesus was saying here. Marriage is not a piece of paper. Marriage is not a certificate from the state of Mississippi or any other state. Marriage is a, is a movement in your life of the, of the Holy Spirit, that it is God that brings you together. And that it is the Spirit of God that joined what God has joined together. I mean, hey, it's okay. If you have a certificate, great. We're not against certificates. If you have the permission of your parents, great. Everybody ought to have permission of their parents. But what a marriage is, a marriage is the bonding of a spirit between one person and another. In other words, that is the most powerful part of marriage that God does this, and it's the Holy Spirit's power. So according to God, it's a spiritual connection with your, with your mate, and that spiritual connection with your mate is more important than the blood relationship with your parents. That's what a priority is. So from the very beginning, God says, Marriage isn't going to work if you're not willing to reprioritize your life. It has to be first or it's not going to work at all. Because love is no accident. It's like the law of gravity. The law of gravity is no accident, right? <coughs> love is developed. Love has grown. Let's say that you found the one that you love. And this is... Uh, this is such an electrifying thing to people to see this. And, 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 I mean, it's just like we have whole television shows nowadays that this is the moment that everyone is waiting for. It is the electrifying moment of this program, like The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, these non-reality shows. They pretend to be reality, but you know that stuff's not real, right? You do know that, right? Okay, I yeah, just know, just thought, thought you would. Can't have 49 uh, microphones and 10 cameras from 14 angles um, and, and it be spontaneous. That's not spontaneous, you know. But let's suppose that you find the one that you want to spend the rest of your life with and here's what happens, right? The young man gets down on his knees and when you see, if you are in a restaurant or somewhere romantic and you see this right here, you start watching, right? Your heart starts beating a little bit because this is going to be the good part. And he has that ring in his hand and he looks at her and he says, will you marry me? Oh, that's, that, that's the exciting, that's the that's electrifying part. That is so romantic. People, oh, that's so romantic. That's... Why is that romantic? What makes that romantic? Why do we feel that way about what he just did? Well, it's because of what he is saying when he gets down on that knee and has that ring and asks that question. Says those three magic words, and it's not, I love you. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it is that I choose you. That's what he's saying when he's down on that knee and he says, will you marry me? 
the electrifying part is that what he means and what we all understand that he means is, I am choosing you over every other thing in my life. I choose you. Over every other relationship in my life, over every other interest in my life, over my occupation, over my, my money, over my uh, future, I, I, I choose you. The priority of my life has now switched from me being the priority of my own life to ask you to allow me to make you the focus of my life. I want you to be the focus of my life for the rest of my life. I, 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 want, I want you to be the relationship that is the highest relationship, barring that relationship with Jesus, being a little higher, the highest relationship in my life. And it's, all, and it's electrifying, and it's exciting, and it's gratifying, and we like to see it because we all want to be chosen by someone. So these keys to love, these, 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 these laws of love actually create love. If you don't follow the keys of love, you'll find yourself becoming complacent and commonplace and falling out of love. And when you do obey the laws of love, uh, that law says you're the priority of my life. I love you. I'm going to put you as the highest priority in my life. It actually creates love in your life. Love is not some force. It's not chemistry. It's not luck. Love comes from God. And what you're saying when you obey the law of priority is, I love you and I would choose you again today just like I chose you before and I will protect you from anything that comes into our relationship that has the potential to take your place in my life because you are the highest priority to me. So let's talk about jealousy for just a second because what happens in relationships when you find that you are no longer priority one, you know what happens to us, male or female? We get jealous. I mean, is, is, is there such a thing as legitimate jealousy? Well, in Exodus 34, I think I have a, it on a passage up here for you. Look at what God says. All right, look, look, look. Is this legitimate jealousy? For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Do you, know what, you know, do you know what the word jealous means? The word jealous means intolerant of rivalry. I am intolerant of rivalry. God says, my name is intolerant of rivalry. <laughs> that's, what, that's what my name is. And I'm not going to put up with anybody that tries to take play, my place in your life. And look in James chapter four. This is a real big one. We all know this one. Adulteresses, adulterers and adulteresses, which is, means James didn't read the book How to Win Friends and Influence People. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be the friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Boy, that's serious. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, but he gives more grace, therefore he says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What in the world is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the fact that the Holy Spirit that is on the inside of us gets jealous for us. And you need to understand what jealousy is. Jealousy means I'm not going to put up with anything that rivals you. I'm intolerant of that. But here's the thing about jealousy. Jealousy can only go as deep as your love. You can't get jealous for something you don't love. One of the words that we use along with jealousy a lot of times is the word envy. You get jealous over things that belong to you. You get envious over things that belong to somebody else. 
But you can't love, I mean, you can't get jealous uh, for something that you don't love. So when I'm jealous for you, I'm intolerant of rivalry and, and, and I don't want anything to compete with you. So what God is jealous about is God created you, God saved your soul, God gifted you, God doesn't want any rivals, he wants to be first place in your life, he deserves to be first place in your life. And when he sees himself being placed further back than first place in his life, he becomes intolerant of that and he begins to move and letting you know that he's not going to give you up without a fight and the Spirit of God is jealous. Now, what I, what, the reason I'm saying all that is because I'm saying to you that it's not wrong to be jealous over a love relationship. God is jealous over a love relationship. It's all right. So let's transfer this to marriage. All right, we're in love, we get married. Um, we know that, that, that we belong to each other first and, and nothing else. Well, you know what happens if you're not careful? Uh, the cycle goes something like this. We meet, we fall in love, we highly prioritize each other. Over time, other things, maybe even other people, begin to take priority over our mate. And before you know it, we're out of love and we're standing in divorce court. And all along the way, all along the way, there have been red flag after red flag after red flag. There have been, there have been all kinds of complaints by your spouse that they are being neglected, that this is, you know, you're not like you used to be. And, all, and what they're saying is, look, I am seeing something take priority over me. We're in a covenant. You said, I'm the highest priority in your life. And nothing is going to take place, my place in your life. And so men, men usually uh, uh, allow work or recreation or, or whatever's going on in, in, in some uh, part of their life to come in. And women begin to sense that and they begin to complain about that and say things about it. Those are red flags saying, hey, pay attention to this. This is important. Women, it's usually the children, the home, um, uh, other things like that, that men begin to feel that they're letting uh, take the energy that they used to get in life. And so the husband is frustrated because he feels like that he's not getting the energy he used to get. And, she's, and the wife feels frustrated because she's feeling like she's not getting the energy that she used to get. And what one or both of you is doing is you are violating the first law of marriage, which is the law of priority. Nothing takes place over your relationship. And this does, the law of priority does not disappear when you quit dating. It does not disappear right after the happy honeymoon. It is an absolutely unbreakable law of love. If you don't have it, you're not gonna have a great relationship. Like I said, you may be stubborn enough to stick it out, but it ain't gonna be happy. This is a law. This is not, this is not some simple decision that you make. It has to be number one, or else it doesn't work at all. You have to listen. When your mate begins to complain and say little things about feeling neglected or, or that you're letting something happen, you need to listen to what they're saying. Let, let, me, let me finish with this little thought. All right. When I was young, when I was a young man and newly married, probably within the first, with, certainly within the first uh, five years of marriage, there was a the men's conference in Meridian where we lived and it was a, called Writing for the Brand and it was a, a men's conference. Steve Farrar is who led it he was a marriage expert and so forth. He spoke to men all over the country back when Promise Keepers and all that was really active. And I remember what he said because I wrote it down because it was the dumbest thing I believe I've ever heard anybody say. He said, he said, men, um, every husband needs to sit down with his wife, maybe over a cup of coffee or in some kind of uh, semi-casual thing like that. You need to sit down with your wife and you need to say to her, tell me what's wrong with me and I will not defend myself. Tell me what's wrong with me and I promise you I'm not going to defend myself. And I thought that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard anybody say. And then I thought, and not only is it dumb, 
It's dangerous. But you know, as I began to think about this thing, as I began to think about it, now remember, I'm young, hot-blooded. I'm in my late 20s. I'm fireball. Uh, Tanya and I have been married uh, five years or so. Uh, we dated growing up, we, you know, all that kind of stuff. Grew up together and all. So I'm thinking to myself, I, why would I do that? Why, why would I sit down and say, tell me what's wrong with me, and I promise you I'm not going to defend myself. I'm not going to fight back and try to give you the excuses. You just tell me what it is that I'm not doing right, and I'll take it. And then I'll change it and I'll start doing it right. And so I went home thinking, I ain't doing that. But as the Lord began to roll that in my mind, I can tell you now after 43 years, I do this all the time. I do this all the time. Now, I don't formalize it like that. I don't sit at a table with a cup of coffee and say, all right, babe, tell me what's wrong with me. I don't formalize it like that. Look, when you've been married as long as we have, you develop like codes, languages, right? I mean, even though men are rabbit ears with tinfoil and women are satellite dishes, uh, you can agree on some codes. And you, and you develop certain phrases and certain things that you say to each other that what it really means is, how, how are we doing? Is there anything that's bothering you? Am I... Am I doing something that, that you don't like? Um, it, 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 are, we, are we still okay? Is everything good? You're not feeling neglected, right? You, you, you know, I don't want you to have to nag me. I don't want you to have to, you know, to say it twice. I don't want you to have to, uh, you know, get all overt about what it is. I, I, want, I want to pick it up before it gets to be a problem. And I say all kinds of things like that, like, you know, just little phrases that you make that really mean, are, okay, are we okay? You're not, this isn't bothering you, is it? Have, uh, did I stay out too late or am I, am I getting where I don't uh, give you enough attention or am I not helping like, you know, you would like for me to help because you're the most important thing in the world to me. Nothing's more invaluable to, to me than you and your happiness. See, a covenant relationship sacrifices your rights. I got a bunch of rights. I don't care. I don't care if I have to sacrifice every one of them. It doesn't matter to me. I want her to be happy. That's a covenant relationship. And you have to listen to each other. Hear what the other one is saying. Pick up on those little things. That's priority. One, one final little tag. I promise you it's a tag. I'll say more about it in a message to come. You have to t you're going to have to teach your children... If, when, you've been, when you're married and you have children in the home with you, you got to teach your children to respect your marriage. Because, you know, children are not complicated. They're really very simple. All they want in life is to dominate your very soul. <laughs> They're not evil. That's just the way they are. They want all your energy they want all your time. They want all your attention. And they don't care who else gets neglected. They want everything you have. And they will take everything you have. And you must protect your marriage from that. If, if, if your mate is number one, you got to have some time together. You got to set aside some stuff. Put some locks on your doors. And make sure they can't pick it because they are really sharp now, I'm going to tell you. You don't want them, you don't want them picking that lock, right? <laughs> They'll be sorry. But anyway, you got to protect. I'll talk more about it. But I just wanted to lay that out there because in priority of marriage, you're going to have to protect it. And the children are really a big a big thing you're gonna to have to protect it from when they're young and they're you know at home and all that kind of stuff, because they they don't they don't know that they're doing it. They don't mean to do it. That's just the way human nature is. They just so you're gonna to have to be the adult and you're gonna to have to set the boundaries and you're gonna to have to say, look, mom and daddy need some time. You get in the bed. Don't come back. A monster's after me. Well, good. You got somebody to talk to. All right. Listen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I need some water. Well, you'll learn not, you, you just had a drink of water. Get to bed, you know, that kind of stuff. All right, let's bow our heads. Right